And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. Good to see everyone as always. I grew up and still am the youngest of three brothers. And when you're the youngest, you're also oftentimes smaller when you're growing up. And even now, fully grown, I'm three inches shorter than my one brother and five inches shorter than my other brother. So it continues that I am smaller. And when you're smaller and you're the youngest, you often see a lot of things as unfair, right? So when I was five and my oldest brother was 11, I would have to be sent to bed much earlier. And for me, it didn't seem fair. Why do I have to go to bed when my oldest brother doesn't have to go to bed? This isn't right. And they would say, be quiet and go to bed. <laughs> and it seemed unfair to me at the time. It was like, well, you have this, you know, parents caucus and we have this sibling uh, lobby and you're trying to divide and conquer our sibling lobby that we have going against you as the parental caucus and epic battle. And you're just trying to divide and conquer the siblings so that we can, don't have the power to rise up and overthrow you. you know? I was fantastical as a child and continued that way. So, but it just didn't seem fair. And we all grow up and we're born into this world with this sense of fairness, this sense of justice. Oftentimes the, the unfairness is made real when we don't get what we want. And notice that as a five-year-old, if I wanted to stay up late, that's actually not good for me. So what I want in fairness is actually something that's bad for me and will make me uh, more miserable and lousy and grumpy the next day. But anyway, we have this sense of fairness in, in the world. And then we come to find that everything isn't always fair, right? Especially you see it with your siblings. And in today's gospel, we have siblings that are kind of experiencing the same unfairness. And what we really get the point of today's gospel is the scandal of grace and how the grace of God is kind of unfair and it's a little scandalous, right? Now, before today's passage, there's three stories of something being lost and being found. The third one being today's lengthy passage that we read, but before it is a story that's often called uh, the lost coin, the parable of the lost coin. And then the next one is often called the parable of the lost sheep. And then today's is often called the parable of the prodigal son. But all of those, naming those stories that way makes us focus on the negative. Right? And at the end of each story, that which was lost is found, and there's much rejoicing. And so in our very naming of these stories, we're looking at the, emphasizing the negative, and it can minimize the joy that goes on. So in the first one, which we didn't read today, someone loses a coin and stops everything and searches, 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 and then they find the coin. And not only do they find it, but they rejoice they go and tell their neighbors that they found it, and they have like a party. And then in the second parable, there's a sheep that gets lost, and so the shepherd leaves all his other sheep, goes and searches for the lost sheep and finds it, brings it back, and then has a big party. Let's rejoice. That which was lost is found. And then in today's parable, obviously you have the youngest son who goes off and squanders everything and ends up with nothing and is lost. And the, the way it's phrased at the end, you almost get a sense that being lost in that way is worse than death. It's like you're alive, but you are lost. You know, people who go through 12-step recovery would talk about just hitting rock bottom, being lost, being at, you're done. And it's almost like an existence that's worse than death. So it's from this point that this son decides, I'm going to go back and, and just work for my father. I'm not going to even want a place in his household. But this is the story of the patient father and the son who was found. And so when he comes back, he hasn't earned it. 
He's in some ways not worthy of it. He, he, he's, he's the lost son who's just uh, ruined everything. But he comes back and the father out of grace and love just embraces him with a great big hug. And it's just like you're found. You're found. And it's like now you have life back in you. You have been found. And it's this beautiful picture of the grace of God. But then we have the older brother who is like, this isn't fair. This isn't right. Like, why does he get this grace? Why does he get to return and be found? And this is where it's like the scandal of grace. Because in some ways it isn't fair. It, it, you know, if you sense like justice, it's like the, the youngest son is lost. He's squandered everything. He's engaged in horrible behavior. And so he doesn't deserve to be welcomed back like some royal son who is worthy of, you know, the nicest robe and the, the party and the feast and the fatted calf. And so we can kind of sympathize with the oldest child. But then we experience the grace of God doesn't always work that way. The grace is the scandal of the grace of God that it's open to everyone. And we're all in. And when you think about the kingdom of God or what we call the beloved community of God, and you think about, well, who gets in? Like if you were to go to the door of the beloved community and there was like a bouncer there with like the little earpiece and the clipboard and he's like, why should I let you in? You know, for me, I might be like, well, I'm a priest, obviously, you know. Unfortunately, the bouncer maybe has known some priests and he's like, no, that's, that's not, no, I've known too many priests, so no, that's not good enough. And it's like, well, I've, I, you know, for me, I might say, well, I've read a lot of books and I've thought really interesting good thoughts and it's like yeah that's that doesn't work it's like well i try my best to love people it's like well you know that's not it and what it is the scandal of grace is that we get in because we all get in and that's beautiful because it means i get it right but then it's also scandalous because there's people that i know that i don't like and I don't think are worthy of getting in, but they get in too. <laughs> By virtue of our humanity, we're in. We're eligible for the grace and love of God. And that's scandalous and also beautiful and amazing. That's why we call it amazing grace. So this week, though, as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but also think, so what about like Vladimir Putin? who started a war and his, his, his army's like executing, killing people, innocent people. Like, is he in? And it's like, well, yeah, but uh, that grace is available to him. But in this story, we get a glimpse of this son who turns from his ways, recognizes his error, and comes back to the father humbly and uh, penitent, right? And I think there's the justice of the world still exists in the world. And so, yeah, Vladimir Putin needs to answer to the powers that be within this world. And he's still eligible for the grace and love of God. But being eligible for that, the scandal of grace, doesn't mean that we forget about the things that were done here on earth. There was a beautiful picture of that, if you remember that movie, Oh, brother, where art thou? Where three men escape from prison, and they're on the run, and then they go by a river, and they see people baptizing people. And they say, come to be baptized, and your sins will be forgiven. And so one of the uh, escaped prisoners goes and gets baptized, and he says, everything's fine. We don't have to be on the run anymore. All my sins are forgiven. And, and uh, the George Clooney character has a great line. He said, well, while your sins may be forgiven in the eyes of the Lord, the state of Mississippi still has something to say about that truck you stole. <laughs> and I think that applies as well. So we are citizens of the beloved community of God, and that scandal of grace is available to us, even each one of us, as uh, fallen and, and wayward as we can be. 
And it's interesting to remember this today, the fourth Sunday in Lent, halfway through Lent. And how are you doing in your Lenten discipline? Because today is a good day where maybe you fell apart, maybe you, you started the first week or two, you did good, but then, oh, work got stressful, this happened, that happened. And uh, you didn't keep to it as faithfully as you wanted. Well, today's the day where we say, grace abounds. Maybe hit a reset today and start your Lenten discipline anew if you haven't been keeping up with it. And you, grace abounds. It's not terrible that uh, you, you weren't able to stick to it. But that grace and love of God is available. And maybe today means, hey, let's hit the reset and start again. we still got a couple more weeks in Lent, and we can still try our best to connect and spend time with God and the beloved community of God. So grace abounds. It is scandalous. And here on earth, with the powers that be, we continue working for justice, equality, and all that. And we're informed by this scandal of grace that welcomes each and every one of us with big old arms of love, saying, you are worthy, you are enough, you are loved.